I got my crew with me over here in the backdrop. Uh, some Angus and Brangus uh, cattle breed. Um, let me first start out by saying that this is not an introductory video on the Proto-Indo-European as a whole. Uh, what I think I'll do is I'll give a brief overview of what it is per se, then I'll go into what I mean by a subsistence quote-unquote economy. Then I will um, actually discuss, you know, what we're here to discuss. Uh, and if you want to, you know, bypass the intro and go straight for the good stuff, feel free to use the, uh, the time cards that I set up for y'all somewhere down below. Right, so take for example the spoken words we use for 1 through 10. Just to keep it simple, we'll start with what's known as the Germanic languages. Now we'll tack on the modern Celtic languages. And now Hindi. Then say Persian. Unsurprisingly, the more isolated each language gets through migrations, the more divergence you get in dialects. And then words begin to evolve, right? But even through thousands of years, you can still vaguely see a striking amount of similarities. So what does this mean? And so by the 19th century, linguists sort of came to the sort of sudden realization that, you know, all of these exerted similarities, we'll call them, sort of mean something. You know, there's a reason behind this, and it's that all of these said languages stem from a single language. You could also say a single people, if you want to phrase it that way, which most people know today as the Proto-Indo-Europeans, hence the title of the video. Um, but most scholars in academia believe that the people uh, speaking this tongue either live just north of the Black Sea, which is pretty much modern day Ukraine, a hot topic right now, I understand that in the uh, contemporary affairs, um, or in Anatolia, which is the ancient name for what is today modern Turkey, central Turkey, I should say, but it's kind of a give or take sort of thing too, geographically. Once again, this isn't really the video for, you know, those sort of two rabbit holes, but of course, if you're curious, I'll go ahead and throw a couple of good videos in the description. Uh, but one more thing I would like to say is that the general time period attributed to this language being spoken is around the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age. That's sort of the beginning to the end that we're talking about here. Approximately 5,000 years ago, I think, is what the, uh, the time period would be. Um, one more thing I would like to preface, actually, too. Most of the sources I'll be using here um, are based on linguistics. So Proto-Indo-European has been considerably reconstructed over the past couple of centuries. And keep in mind that if a word can be reconstructed, then we know that it is more than likely native to that people. Thus, or I should say to that language, thus the concept of the item that, you know, we're talking about would be in use by the people speaking it. More than likely, it is native to the people. I, it's not 100% of the time, but go ahead and you can go ahead and assume that it, it would most likely be the case here. And real quickly, I know this is like the third time I said this was my final preface, uh, but when I say subsistence economy, quote unquote, uh, I'm not necessarily alluding to the methods of acquiring wealth. Subsistence more so means supporting yourself or a group on a provisions level, um, you know, whatever provides the basic standard of living. It's important to distinguish this because how these ancient people obtained wealth versus how they subsisted could very well mean two different things entirely. I mean, their mythology kind of suggests this, but that's entirely another video we could uh, dive into a whole nother time. Now, considering the sheer volume of cognate terms related to livestock, these people were likely pastoralists who may, who may have also flirted with farming on the side. So, Let's first consider the English word fee, you know, as in like a payment of some sorts. So this word is also cognate with the word for cattle in German, fee, das fee. And when I say cognate, I mean ultimately both descend from the same word. So initially you might think this is like a strange coincidence or something, right? But another cognate word is the Latin pecu, which usually denotes cattle or livestock kind of in general. And if you attach the suffix onto it, pecunia, it meant money or even property. This list goes on and on, but you know, if you follow this sort of um, breadcrumb trail, you eventually arrive at the Proto-Indo-European root, peku, which, you know, probably meant livestock or possessions. This is how deeply ingrained these animals were for the society's livelihood. In fact, uh, many pastoral-related words come from this proto-language, terms that many use to this day, you know, especially us more rural folk. Uh, but I'll give you some more examples right here, actually. So the English word cow ultimately descends from the Proto-Indo-European wolves. This very well could have been an umbrella term for a bovine animal of some sort, so like an ox, bull, cow in general, though of course over time it came to mean a female specifically, if this theory is solid, I should say, and for the sake of the Germanic family too. Um, also note the Proto-Indo-European stauros or tauros. This term evolved differently throughout Europe in particular. So in the Germanic languages, an S was either kept or added from the original word, and its connotation sort of stuck with the theme of a young bull, 
then eventually a steer in English. However, over in the more southern Mediterranean uh, part of the world, the term evolved without the S at the beginning, and it simply suggested a bull. So all these things considered, the original term probably had to do with a male bovine, maybe even a particular species, who knows? This is just kind of mere conjecture at this point. That the horse was known to the Proto-Indo-European community is undeniable, as can be seen from the impressive series of correspondences. Many of you probably already know the importance of this animal to this people. I mean, arguably it's it's the face of the group, you know, if you consider the migrations, later mythology, and obviously the descended languages. So the reconstructed root of this animal was something like equos. And here you can see the initial phonetic changes sometimes shortly after the big migration or migrations. I think there's still a mix of debate going on there. But I mean, comparatively, the word pretty much stayed intact, it, or at least it's still slightly recognizable from the original. However, in the later phases of these languages, the cognate words start to evolve more differently. So like in some regions, like ancient Greece or Gaul per se, the labial velar qu sound became a bilabial plosive. So hippos and epos. In other regions, the w, the w sound, shifted to a v, a v sound. And notice how, you know, even though Sanskrit and Lithuanian are not spoken, you know, close to each other whatsoever, they evolved kind of similarly, which is pretty neat in my opinion. But, you know, also in some places, the consonantal sounds remained mostly unchanged, but a slight diphthong or monothong might have formed with the vowels. So the Latin equus and the Celtiberian equo are the examples I provided here. I just, I mainly wanted to demonstrate how well attested these, this animal is to this group linguistically. It really doesn't, it really doesn't get much better than this, honestly, when it comes to a philology. And I really shouldn't be excited about this as much as I am, but, you know, <laughs> here we are. Pigs held a major role in the Proto-Indo-European society. In fact, I would go as far to say that the linguistic clues surrounding this animal are one of the most underrated tools we have to understand the subsistence economy of this people. And I promise you that's probably the most controversial thing I'll say in this video. So Dr. J.P. Mallory makes the case that this proto-group may not have been as strictly pastoral as we initially thought, and a major case for this argument is the pig itself. He argues that the, that pigs are normally excluded from any regime of pastoral nomadism. That's actually a direct quote. Basically, they're an indication that a, a group is stable, uh, immobile, idle, whatever synonym you kind of want to muster for it. Then he goes on to say, the linguistic evidence for pig is unequivocal as a Proto-Indo-European su is found widely. This right here is just a simple chart I made to show some of the cognates that descend directly from this reconstructed root. It's pretty interesting how well the original sound stayed intact, comparatively speaking. Another interesting note is that some words ev eventually developed with a specific gender in mind. So, for example, the Sioux in Old English paved way for the female swine. But many words that descended from the Proto-Indo-Iranian meant a male swine or a boar. My personal take on Dr. Mallory's theory, you might ask, is although pigs aren't typically affiliated with pastoralism uh, because of their association with being settled down, you know, that doesn't inherently mean that's always the case. Uh, of course, Mallory is one of the leading experts uh, in his field, so he probably knows more than I, <laughs> but if he's correct, um, then the preconception of this culture might need some rethinking here and there, actually. But simply put, I think the evidence is still stacked against it currently. Beyond these few, terms surrounding goat and sheep are actually very well attested in the Indo-European languages. In fact, wool is a very ancient word. Um, its Proto-Indo-European root is quite intimidating to the untrained eye, I'll be honest with you, but an array of varied words descend from it, actually. So the word flannel in English is actually borrowed from the Welsh descendant of this proto-root. Kind of neat how these variant words sometimes make a full circle in the language family, little side note. But yet over on the other side of Europe, the Greek word for fleece comes from the same root. So originally in Greek mythology, it wasn't the golden fleece, it was the golden wooled fleece. There's also many other terms that aren't specific to animals, but pastoralism at large. There's this root right here, which the English word herd comes from in expressions like herding cattle or, or shepherd. There's also this one right here from which the word marrow descends from, as in bone marrow. Though I think likely it was probably connected to cattle bones or, or particularly early on, but you know, I don't want to overload you with too much joy today, so we'll avoid that one for now. Hopefully by now you're somewhat convinced that their subsistence economy primarily revolved around livestock or just ranching in general. However, however, as we alluded to earlier, there's also reasonable evidence to think that there's more to that. Okay, so not only did this society engage in the practice of stock breeding or ranching, they also, to a much lesser degree, mind you, 
messed with agriculture some. And in fact, the prefix to that word, Americans pronounce it ag, actually stems from a Proto-Indo-European root itself. And what's more is both that prefix and the word acre actually come from the exact same root, uh, but through different languages, I believe, since the prefix came from Latin. Don't call me on that though. Plus there's a mountain of reconstructed variants for the word so. So, okay, you can imagine how this might happen if you really dissect the word more broadly, or the concept, I should say. So things like scatter, implant, you know, disseminate can all sort of be extracted from this one simple action related to sowing seeds. So, you know, the, but the point is the people were almost definitely engaging in this practice at large. And just real quick, before I wrap up with like an overall summary, this is from Dr. Mallory's analytical study on Proto-Indo-European cognates in a given semantic field. If we look at both the mammal and the agriculture categories in particular, then we get a good sense of comparison, I believe. We can see that the mammal category, which livestock probably would have fallen under, does handily contain more cognates than plants and agriculture, but not really by a heavy margin per se. Now, of course, I left out a plethora of other roots that play into this theme, but I hope I gave you a proper idea of what this people's subsistence economy sort of looked like. Essentially, the perception that they were strictly pastoral nomads isn't entirely accurate, and signs um, partially suggest that agriculture actually played a slightly uh, larger role than we originally thought with them. I'm also over, oversimplifying a lot here, <laughs> um, and that's because this is more so a basic overview, of course. But at the end of the day, the evidence is still stacked in favor of a primarily uh, pastoral society at large here. Um, do try and keep in mind that new research is being published on this stuff frequently, and you know, old ideas are constantly being usurped by new ones. So, you know, just know that I use credible sources here, but at some point in time, a couple of things might be discredited, you never know. Um, anyway, that's, that's all for this here segment, and until next time.